Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining today's uh, webinar on how to make your investments in storage and applications work better. Uh, we'll wait a couple more minutes for some attendees to join. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for joining our session today on how to make your investments in storage and applications work better. This is the first in our fall webinar series in which we would like to share our experiences with you regarding the many options to eliminate cost and complexity associated with the distributed storage environment. Um, we'll keep you informed as, as there's more to come. We got webinar sessions in October and November that will dig a little bit deeper from a technical point of view. Uh, for today's sessions, we've actually started the recording. Um, if you have any questions, please pose them in the questions section. We'll pick them up at the tail end of the session. We have a couple of polls that we will uh, highlight during the course of the presentation. And in the handout section, you can find some collateral, some materials that you can take with you uh, after the session to get that going. So again, thank you very much for joining. Uh, just to confirm, can everyone see my desktop? Put up a yes in the chat, and I'm happy. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. So again, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Jaap van Dijven Bode. I'm product director with uh, Talon. I've uh, been with the company since inception, and I'm primarily responsible for product strategy. And today with me is Andrew Mullen, our senior VP of sales and marketing. And uh, Andy is going to talk to us about uh, who Talon is, the agenda, and he will also talk a little bit about uh, some customer experiences 
uh, that we've uh, we've had over the years and uh, some of the decision criteria around how those organizations have managed to distribute storage. So, Andy, the, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Yap, and thanks, everyone, for joining uh, this morning. We're really excited to bring this three-part webinar series to uh, the audience as well as um, um, our existing clients as well as prospective clients. Um, just to give you a quick snapshot, who is Talon? Um, Talon was founded back in 2010 by storage, file system, and WAN optimization professionals that have a deep domain expertise in those areas. Um, we were founded just really around helping organizations to solve the challenges around distributed storage. And I know that sounds like a very high level um, case, but as we've evolved over the last seven years, you'll see how the industry has evolved as well and, and how we came about solving those challenges um, from a software defined perspective and, and providing a fabric for large enterprise organizations. We're headquartered in Mount Lowell, New Jersey, which is roughly 20 minutes outside of Philadelphia and about an hour and 10 minutes outside of New York City. We do have offices in India and engineering. We have um, technical office in Netherlands, sales offices in the United Kingdom that support Europe, as well as multiple offices throughout the, uh, the United States. So the, the premise of talent and in, in, in how we got started was really to, to, to deliver a software defined storage solution for distributed enterprise. And doing that in a, um, an agnostic fashion that allows organizations to leverage existing infrastructure, but also prepare themselves for the future considerations around hybrid cloud, cloud infrastructure, and lowering their cost of computing. We have over 350 customers globally that vary in size from five locations all the way up to hundreds of locations. One of the most scalable solutions in the industry. We're deployed at over 10,000 press plus branches globally. And just a snapshot of some of the customers below here is healthcare, um, medical research, obviously market research, toy manufacturing, large construction companies, retail and sourcing with Target, Toyota, manufacturing, United Technologies, in terms of the ability to manufacture, uh, follow the sun design approach. Vista Simpress, which is a, um, um, market uh, web to um, web to print organization and obviously companies like WSP, Parsons, Brinkenhoff. The business verticals that we address are in the architectural engineering construction, marketing design, manufacturing research, as well as energy and financial services. So we're not limited by any verticals because each one of these verticals has their own challenges and use cases that Talon has been addressing over the last seven years. So let's talk a little bit about what today's agenda is. As Yap had mentioned, this is a three-part series. Today is really talking about how do you leverage and manage distributed storage environments. We want to talk today around what are the biggest challenges in the, in, in the enterprise today? What are data center uh, storage considerations? We know there are a lot of options for customers and a lot of vendors that are presenting ideas and concepts of how to get to the cloud or how to manage existing infrastructure and being able to do that. Um, and uh, we want to talk a little bit about that. We also want to talk about the impact of the data center and cloud storage industry trends, because I think it's important for us to pro project in terms of how we see it, being agnostic to those environments and how customers are communicating back to us what seems to be working and what actually isn't working. So I want to be very clear about today's session. It's not about selling products. It's not about talking about features and functionality. It's talking about our experience over the last seven years, what's worked really well and what hasn't worked really well. Then we're going to talk about branch office storage considerations. <clears throat> if you're using traditional, if you're using storage um, NAS filers out there, are you doing backup, replication, workarounds, and what solutions have worked? What solutions haven't worked? We know that a lot of organizations are now embracing the ability to start centralizing and consolidating. And how are they doing that? What seems to be working? What hasn't worked? So we're going to talk about local storage infrastructure, data replication, storage controllers. And then what we're going to talk about is what we call a perfect world scenario, a software defined approach, not being tied to hardware, not being tied to any back end storage, taking this software defined approach and allowing your organization to systematically phase in um, a centralization and consolidation approach. We're going to give you some customer examples where we've uh, had success 
um, working with various technology partners in back-end storage infrastructure. And then we're going to open up to question and answer sessions for the, the floor to, um, to ask us questions and just actually talk, generally speaking, about some of their experiences. As Yaf said, we have two poll questions that will allow us to really identify if some of these trends are really apparent in terms of what's going on in your organization. And then we're going to actually, um, moving forward, we have two more sessions, as Yaf had mentioned. One is October 25th. It's going to get a little bit more detailed around specifically how that actual technology can work in favor of uh, a customer's enterprise organization for centralization and consolidating data using a software-based fabric. And then we're going to talk about underlying features around what is intelligent file caching, streamlining the IT resources, and potentially eliminating branch office backups. We're looking forward to today and future sessions as well. Yeah. Great, thank you uh, very much, Andy. And uh, let me just start off with something that we've been observing uh, when we speak to our customers. We, we often find that in those distributed storage environments, 80% of the data that they manage is unstructured data. Think about your file level data. And what we also see, if we get into a project to kind of reorganize their storage and centralize and consolidate that storage, we find that only 10% of that data is actively used in the enterprise. So I always ask the question, like, why would you provision all of that storage that is rarely or maybe even never used? And we see that customers leverage a tier one storage for unstructured data. They leverage branch office file storage. And because of the exponential growth of that storage, it's very hard to keep up with those requirements and the sizing requirements. So we believe that there is a better way to uh, effectively manage your distributed storage footprint and um, focus more on presenting active data sets throughout the environment. So I'm going to bring up a quick poll question and I would like to understand a little bit more about um, what you're managing. And the question is, are you managing distributed branch office storage? And at the same time, are you managing unstructured data in that environment? So I'm going to launch this poll. And I'm going to give it a minute for everyone to answer the question. You may or may not be able to answer. Just put something in that's closest to what applies to you as an organization. Um, it would be good to understand a little bit more. And based on the results of this poll, poll we'll actually um, talk about how do you manage distributed storage environments, address certain aspects around branch office storage consolidation, etc. Just going to wait for this. Nice. I think we got obviously 60, 65% of the voters uh, or the, the, the attendees have voted, and the common denominator here is either, yes, my branch office. Are leveraging local file storage um, or my branch office data is managed separately and uh, that's that's really good and that's what we're seeing as, as a trend as well you know uh, in, the, in the early 2000s organizations started to to centralize and consolidate and they couldn't deliver the performance and that's why a lot of organizations as they started to virtualize their branch offices came back to a more of a decentralized model with things like replication so kind of uh, the answers here kind of confirm what our observations are with the, with the customer. So that's great. So thank you very much for filling that out. I'm going to close the poll in 10 to 15 seconds. And then we'll kind of continue. I'm going to talk a little bit more about, you know, your typical data center considerations as you're looking to uh, move your storage workloads into a single location. So when you're looking to centralize and consolidate your distributed storage environments, a lot of our customers typically look at the various options available to them. Um, you know, do I stay with my traditional storage platforms? Am I going to explore the options of software-defined, hybrid, or public cloud uh, storage infrastructure? And what are the key decision factors in that process? The first question that you typically ask uh, when I'm working with a customer that's pre preparing for a centralized environment is, you know, what does my data footprint look like? 
is that 80%, is that accurate? Or is it even more? Um, how am I going to centrally manage this? Are there any regulations in terms of compliance? Do I have to worry about data residency? Can I put this in a cloud or do I need to manage this on premise? So we kind of broke this down twofold. And um, what we're seeing when customers are considering on-premise data center storage, you know, your traditional storage vendors you may have worked with for, for many, many years, the benefits that they see is that you know, they, they, they're able to deliver enhanced compliance because they can pretty much pick up that storage infrastructure, migrate it to new platforms, or architect a solution that allows uh, for similar approach of combining tier one or tier two type of storage. Um, as a result, they see improved business continuity, and they're able to really uh, align with their RTO, RPO requirements around things like backups and snapshots. Uh, on the downside, though, is what we're seeing is building and managing those storage infrastructures uh, is typically ex expensive. It's very hard to continually add shells to a, uh, to a disk subsystem as your data is growing exponentially. So capacity planning can be really complex and it's very difficult to scale up and down at times. Um, also, if you're considering a full-blown DR, it requires you to kind of double or triple the amount of your storage investments and your network infrastructure as you're basically you know, using those traditional replication technologies to synchronize both primary data center and backup data center. So there's quite a few, quite a few benefits there. But there's also definitely a bunch of considerations. And where we see the trends now, um, over the last 12 to 18 months, I see, I think, 50% of the engagements that we're in. Uh, the, the hot topic is obviously, uh, how can the cloud help, help me? Uh, there's a cloud-first strategy coming up all the way from the food chain, down the food chain. We need to make sure that we leverage cloud options and we evaluate the options in that sense. So the benefits there are really around the flexibility and the scalability, whether that's hybrid cloud, whether that's maybe HCI infrastructure, or whether you're using public cloud infrastructure with, with Azure or Amazon or some, some, some tools on top of that. Um, the nice thing about that model is you pretty much only pay for what you use as you go. So basically, you have a flexible approach. You can manage terabytes or petabytes worth of storage in an environment, but you're only paying uh, what you're actually using. Uh, the problem here, though, is you have lesser control. I'm not saying minimal control uh, with regards to your redundancy um, HA infrastructure in the R strategy, where you would, in an on-premise environment, you know, be able to identify X amount of copies of your data residing at different data centers that are controlled by your staff, that are monitored by your staff. You got to give that out of hands a little bit. You got to say, okay, I'm going to trust. Uh, the management of my IS workloads and my storage workloads to a cloud provider, um, and we see that you know obviously due to the, due to the uh, the evolution of cloud that customers are becoming more comfortable with that approach. There's no need to buy or maintain additional on-premises hardware. Of course, you have your traditional Windows servers, your maybe your virtualization platforms, your strategy, but a lot of workloads as you move them in the cloud drastically reduce not only the complexity, but also the cost associated with that on-premise infrastructure. Um, if you enable cloud or hybrid cloud storage, especially when you're thinking about petabytes worth of storage and maybe geo-redundancy, uh, it can be costly. And, you know, it sounds a little weird, but it is actually the case that if you're looking at you know, having six copies of your data or multiple availability sets or multiple availability zones, the cloud may or may not work for you. And, you know, I see, you know, there's, there's some drastic benefits. Uh, I know both Microsoft and Amazon, they're lowering their costs. They want to get people into their clouds and it becomes more affordable in that sense, which is really great. Um, if we think about data center storage, you know, uh, we think about cloud storage, we typically associate the following subject matters. You know, what type of storage do I need? Do I want to provide file level data? Do I want to just be storage agnostic in a way that I'm using things like iSCSI or Fiber Channel? Am I looking for more intelligent solutions that deliver me block storage or object storage based on 
a software defined approach or an HCI approach? How do I centrally manage my data? How do I carve out my volumes? What is my strategy around authentication, authorization, ACLs, and NTFS permissions? And do, does my solution uh, integrate with my enterprise backup solutions? You may want to leverage embedded backup tools or solutions in those, in, in those storage solutions, but I see a lot of customers still utilizing their traditional backup solutions as well. So you may want to think about that when you make that decision. Um, subsequently, if you break it down into two, into three different scenarios, we can recap that we see a um, significant amount of on-premise storage uh, where customers are managing unstructured data on tier one storage or ACI, uh, typically fiber channel or iSCSI, where they leverage their third-party backups and snapshots. And again, it's the combination of cost and uh, managing, you know, managing complexity. And it's a, a consideration there is how do you manage your DR strategy? Do I need to make a full-blown copy of my storage infrastructure or can I leverage more intelligent approaches? Hybrid, hybrid cloud storage, we see that customers want to leverage the cloud as a storage tier, not only for the purpose of backup and archival, but also for the purpose of snapshots and performance and DR strategies. Uh, there are solutions out there that can do can deliver block level storage. There's also a solution that can do file level storage. So the based on the way that you're managing your data, either one would work, work better for the other. If you are, for example, an, an AEC firm that has live projects that say, okay, if the project is closed out, I want to stub out my files and archive the files because we closed the project. Uh, that would be a file level approach. If you would say, well, I want to have a solution that automatically tiers the data between SSD, between uh, uh, HDD, and maybe uh, maybe the cloud. That's where, where a block level solution will fit. The, the, the considerations, in a sense, uh, would be performance. You know, if you're used to tens of thousands of IOPS on a tier one storage platform, am I getting the same performance from this hybrid cloud model? Uh, we do see very good results in that sense. Uh, different solutions that are available in the market. Um, understanding your active data set is really important because you want to make sure that your local tier actually matches that 10% of active data that you're utilizing throughout your environment. And the solution should always come with things like snapshots, uh, tiering, the ability to scale out whether you have 10 terabytes of storage or whether you're looking at 2 petabytes of storage. And you want to think about, am I locked into a specific vendor? Can I always retrieve my data if I'm not, not happy with a solution as such? And subsequently, and this is something that is fairly new still, uh, we do have a bunch of customers that leverage public cloud storage as a whole. And we see a trend that customers want to kind of eliminate their data center storage and leverage the cloud as a full-blown data center for storage workloads, IaaS workloads, etc. We recently had a great project that we did together with uh, with SoftNAS that runs a cloud uh, NAS in, in, in Azure or Amazon, and it allows you to um, pretty much um, eliminate the need for managing local storage, which is really great. However, the considerations are what are my charges going to look like? You know, how, many, how much am I going to pay for my storage? How much am I going to pay for my additional services? And are there any egress char charges that I need to take into consideration? And how about my RTO and RPO requirements? So that kind of sums up, you know, the, the considerations when it comes to managing your data center aspect of your environment, whether that's on-premise, hybrid, or in the, in the cloud as a whole. So with that said, I would like to um, open it up for another poll before we continue and talk about, you know, the impact of, of storage and the trends around cloud enablement of storage. And I'm going to open it up for another minute. And if you can answer the question around how much unstructured you, data you typically manage throughout your enterprise, I know this is a very tough question. Um, it's often, you know, it's the guesstimate. You know, you have your, maybe you have a local file storage. You may have already centralized. It's a little easier. But if you could just give me an estimate, and give us a, an idea of what that looks like in your environment, then um, I will talk to you about, you know, the impact and what we're seeing in the market. So let's give it another 45 seconds.
Yeah, we're at 60% voted. <clears throat> so I'm going to give it a couple of more seconds. And I can see that the vast majority of the, uh, the attendees, they're somewhere between the 11 and 50 terabyte mark. And after that, 50 to 100 terabytes, which is, uh, which is, which is kind of interesting as it, as it matches what we're seeing as well. I think our average customer has starts off with somewhere around the 100 terabyte mark. And we're going to give some examples at the tail end of the session. Uh, where we also have customers that deal with multiple petabytes worth of storage. So I'm going to give it 15 more seconds and I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to move on to the next. Yeah. Thank you very much for voting. Um, basically, the answer kind of cons corresponds with what we're seeing and what also um, industry specialists and analysts are seeing throughout the, uh, throughout the realm of public cloud storage. And if you look at the fact that 64% of enterprises, they plan to purchase cloud storage in the next 12 months, it actually means you know, a combination of SaaS, PaaS workloads, IaaS workloads. What we're seeing is that the largest growing workloads is IaaS and foremost storage so you know thinking about blob storage think about your your data uh, data lakes SQL databases SQL workloads uh, unstructured data uh, aggregated workloads in terms of multiple blob cool storage cold storage you name it um, the average enterprise has 30 terabytes of data stored in cloud storage services which kind of matches with what I'm seeing in the poll where the average a uh, voter has between 11 and 50 terabytes worth of storage. Um, we will know, and what we're seeing is that file storage will explode by 3x this year and the coming years. And with that comes the problems of data management protection and access. And that's, that's always been a challenge um, in environments, and especially when you're dealing with complex applications, for example, engineering, manufacturing, those files are getting bigger and bigger. The exports are getting bigger. The uh, the models, the 3D, the VR aspect to it, um, you know, storage is going is, is here to stay. And I think if you're more if you're intelligent around dealing with that storage infrastructure, I think you can you can you can benefit from different types of models, uh, hybrid cloud or public cloud. But you have to think obviously about your distributed infrastructure. You got to think about um, how do I manage productivity and how do I ensure that the applications and storage that I'm managing in my distributed offices are going to get the same type of performance that they would typically get from our local storage infrastructure or they would get from um, you know a high performance storage platform so if you look at you know considerations around branch office storage we typically see that there's two types of impacts when you're looking at uh, managing storage uh, first you have the IT impact of managing islands of data how do you manage your your file sets how do you manage your ACLs your permissions how do you Manage your local backups. Are you replicating data back to the data center or into the cloud? Is that a is that a feasible model? Um, do you leverage things like replication, and or do you do you uh, see your file storage to grow exponentially, where it becomes to becomes painful to manage that infrastructure, but also replication or cloud integration causes excessive network utilization. We also see that there's an impact from an EFSS perspective as users will find a way and they say well you know you can't really give me the performance to allow for collaboration so i'm going to spin up uh enterprise file share and sync solutions that are typically consumer grade solutions which gives you the headache of managing shadow it and as a result you will see drastic cost increase um things like cloud gateways controllers they really require significant investments from a from not only from a hardware perspective, not only from a cloud perspective, but also from things like bandwidth. The more sites you deploy, the more bandwidth you need in order to ensure productivity. And when we're talking about productivity, we're talking about the business impact. If you have a decentralized model and you're managing islands of data, you may incur duplicate or conflicting file versions. You will have and experience issues around data loss and file integrity issues if one office one works on one version of the truth, and the other one is working on another version of the truth. And it can drastically impact the business workflow 
And in some scenarios, we see customers leveraging tools or solutions like VDI, and especially in high latency environments, those types of solutions fall short when it comes to working on those applications. So the impact is twofold. There's an IT impact, and there's a business impact in these types of models. And let me just zoom in before I hand it back over to Andy in terms of um, what those typical models look like and the and the kind of the, the considerations when, when, when choosing for these models. So the first one is local file storage. And as we could see in the polls, I think we were looking at approximately 33% um, of the audience. They manage in unstructured data infrastructure in their branch offices as local storage. And you know, what we've seen is it's very difficult to manage that storage and server infrastructure because you have no limitations in terms of growth. You can't really control the user. You can't really control what's active and what's, what's archived data. It's really painful to manage backups as well. And from a productivity perspective, we see often that there's duplicate data residing on multiple file servers. And you can't really collaborate because you're working on an isolated data set. So considerations there are what is the cost associated with that model and what, what, what type of flexibility does the local file storage model give me? Those could be traditional storage devices. Those could be NAS filers. Those could be you know, your typical Windows server with a bunch of file shares on them. And you see the evolution as customers have tried local file storage and they needed to introduce collaboration. They started to look at solutions like data replication. For example, DFSR. We see it everywhere. Everywhere customers have tried to use DFSR. It's painful to manage. It's inconsistent. You have to kind of resolve conflicts of files. You still deal with increased storage footprint because you don't know, still don't know what's active and what's archived. And it costs a lot in terms of management uh, of the replication task and ensuring that the data is there and at, at a given time. So from a scalability perspective, we've seen, especially when you have five or more offices, that you know, replication is not really a, a good solution for that. It doesn't really allow you to scale out, and it doesn't allow you to collaborate in real time on large enterprise file sets. Uh, with that, we've seen over the last three to four years the, uh, uh, the, the, the coming of what's called cloud controllers. And cloud controllers are typically used to simplify storage not only at the branch office, but also at the data center, and are often used to eliminate a data center storage and leverage the cloud as their main repository of storage without, you know, central, without centralized control, centralized management. All of your storage is typically created as a proprietary unified file system um, and, and basically are still based on the semantics of things like cloud replication and synchronization. So we see that the customers have, that have tried solutions as such, they're challenged with performance, they're challenged with things like scalability, and they're also challenged with cloud, cloud charges. Sometimes it takes weeks to recover from a disaster scenario at a specific branch office as they have to rehydrate the files from the cloud, and therefore your egress charges will go up. Uh, and, and you're kind of locked in from a vendor perspective as well. So I think there's different solutions for different use cases. One isn't better than the other. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's different, some definitely considerations for you to think about when you're, you're talking about, you know, the IT aspect as well as the business aspect. And um, again, we're not talking about what we're doing right now. We're talking about what we're seeing in the industry. But in our next sessions, we will talk a little bit more about what a perfect world scenario would look like and how our technology can, can layer on top of that to basically provide you the best of all the worlds, worlds together. So to wrap it up from my end, um, if we talk to our customers, we typically get the feedback that they want to accomplish this perfect world scenario. They want to get to this single set of data, a single authoritative data set that is centralized, uh, whether that's on-premise or in the cloud or a combination of both, uh, is secured, um, fits within the realm of authentication and authorization frameworks, i.e. Active Directory, is secured using encryption, um, maybe deduplication, all that stuff. Um, also solutions that are easy to scale out, either from a capacity perspective or from a, from a branch office perspective. You may have 20 branch offices today, 
Your company may acquire another company, and next thing you know, you have 100 offices. And that is something that we're seeing often. So you want to have a solution that scales out horizontally as well as vertically in terms of the storage that you can offer to your, uh, to your uh, users. Uh, in addition to that, when you're working on a single set of data, you can ensure data consistency. And that's really important for those customers that are collaborating either around follow the, follow the sun or um, in real time with applications like Autodesk, uh, Bentley, Dassault Systems, the complex engineering appl applications, but also applications like your traditional Microsoft Office or your PDFs or exchanging information that is design information and design projects, for example, Adobe. Um, and what we hear more and more, customers, they want to have a software-defined flexibility. Uh, flexibility to deploy solutions on top of their existing hypervisor platforms, on top of any type of commodity hardware that they can leverage to create, um, uh, and, uh, to create room for the future to grow in terms of capacity, in terms of workloads, in terms of demand from a user's perspective and from an application perspective. And at least... Um, last but not least, uh, we see a strong demand for uh, distributed file locking where uh, you kind of protect your data in a sense that if I'm making a change to a file from Amsterdam and Andrew is making a change from the US, I'm not able to overwrite someone else's changes and I always work on an authoritative data set that is protected. So file locking is really important in those distributed environments when you're, when you're working on unstructured data. So that is what a perfect world scenario typically looks like. And based on that premise, we have architected the Talon Fast solution, which we'll be talking about in the, um, in the forthcoming sessions. And with that, I want to hand it over back to Andy to talk about some customer examples and wrap it up before we open it for Q&A. Great, great. Thanks, Yap. I appreciate it. And um, I'm really interested in some of those poll numbers. They do align with exactly what we're seeing in terms of the amount of data that's being managed and, and how it's being managed. I want to talk about three um, distinct customer examples. And each one of these customers, we're going through the process of re reviewing, um, one, a storage refresh, um, two, the ability to figure out how to consolidate and centralize infrastructure, and three, how do you reduce complexity? And each one of these is unique because um, we were able to enable um, th that strategy, but do it in a fashion that didn't force them to do um, particularly a straight up cloud integration or a hybrid cloud or an on-prem. We allowed the customer to do their due diligence and work with them to, draw, to, to drive a, uh, a, a strong ROI and TCO and, and a journey to managing unstructured data. The first example is a large construction engineering firm out of Sweden. They had over 15,000 uh, 15, users globally with over 270 branch offices. They were managing north of a petabyte of storage throughout all of these various locations. So you can imagine um, how complex that infrastructure was um, and their, their willingness to look at alternatives to be able to manage the data and potentially lower their um, cost of um, computing as well as management. The strategy that they went with, and this is based on their existing infrastructure, they had three power and HP enterprise storage on the back end. Um, and it gave them the option to archive into the cloud using a software defined storage extensions with that existing platform. They wanted to migrate from legacy WAN optimization. WAN optimization had been in the environment for over six years and it was solving the issue around um, you know, file access, um, file acceleration, um, as well as a lot of different HTTP applications. And as you know, as they evolved, a lot of the engineering applications that are used in today's environments are um, file-aware, unstructured um, applications that need a solution that actually allows for high performance. So the WAN optimization was coming to an end of life. They were looking for alternatives across 200 offices that had WAN optimization. Um, and while that was going on, they looked at saying to themselves, how do we eliminate that 80-20 rule where 80% of the data out at the branch offices really was archival data that didn't need to be utilized on a day-to-day -day basis? And they really were working on probably about an, a six to nine month window of active data. So what they were able to do is streamline that branch office infrastructure. 
they leverage the caching technology to present active data set to end users, but also layering into their Microsoft Enterprise, which is really important, so they could continue to use DFS infrastructure, continue to use um, authentication um, rights and, and, and privileges, and look to the future in terms of how they're gonna leverage their Azure infrastructure for the future. The second example I thought was interesting as well because this is a web to print design global firm, over 6,000 users, over distributed over 19 countries with two petabytes of storage. This was one that we worked hand in hand with the Microsoft team um, they had looked at other controller solutions. Um, as you know, web to print they deal with a lot of file system, a lot of file level and design level um, applications. And one of the issues with the full-blown cloud controller environment was that um, they had trouble with uh, metadata replication and just overall storage proliferation at the branch office. Um, working with Microsoft, a point solution, which is replication and an overlay file system to migrating them from AWS to Azure, leveraging the hybrid store simple and Azure cloud. What was really interesting about this particular client is, is they were very um, technical in nature and knew a lot about Microsoft underlying technologies. So they opted to use the PowerShell DSC for streamlined deployment and automation. They literally were able to drag and drop each one of those particular sites make sure that they knew what the active data set was and, and actually deploy these in a very streamlined fashion. <clears throat> it's now being managed out of Azure with Azure Resource Manager. They were able to reduce their storage footprint by 70%. Um, they were able to collapse a lot of NetApp infrastructure. They continue to use some of the NetApp infrastructure at the data center, but also leveraging um, hybrid um, cloud to be able to do archival and backup, which really worked nice and elegantly for them. The third customer, which I thought was very interesting, and this is one of the examples that um, we knew existed, we knew people wanted to get there, we just didn't know how quickly customers were gonna go there. This is a marketing research firm. Everyone probably knows who they are. They're big in the automotive, autom automotive industry in terms of ratings. They literally wanted to eliminate their data center. They wanted to get out of the data center business. They had a lease on a data center that was on-prem and uh, it was coming to end of life. The company had um, been absorbed by a large hedge fund and the large hedge fund didn't want to be in the business of managing infrastructure. So they eliminated the lease on the on-prem data center storage and server infrastructure. They wanted to migrate all their data into AWS. They wanted to host all these VMs in AWS leveraging what they call the soft NAS cloud, which is a NAS solution that sits within the cloud and actually front ends the back end data center and actually allows for backup and archive and streamline data um, implementation. Our solution was distributed uh, across the uh, various sites on Dell EMC Hyperconverged, leveraging SDS VM instances and leveraging that caching technology. This particular opportunity, there was an ROI and TCO in 11 months. So what I think what, I, what I'd like you to take from these examples is you're able to cut storage costs, potentially up to 82% we've seen. You're able to transparently integrate from a software defined storage perspective as we said previously in this conversation, there isn't um, a perfect world scenario where everyone has to go to the cloud immediately or do hybrid cloud or leverage on-prem. It all is based on where you are on that journey, going to the cloud, but going to a centralization and consolidation model. But I will say there's one thing that is very important. One is the ability to lever leverage and eliminate things like distributed backup, which can be challenging and complex. And the other is, is when you move to a centralized data model, you have to ensure high performance application experience on a global scale. Otherwise, the project will fall down and, 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 and it will fail. So I think from these customer examples, they're very large in nature. Some, some had different strategies, but we were able to help enable them from an agnostic standpoint, leveraging uh, existing infrastructure, uh, refreshing up, uh, up infrastructure, and getting them to, um, to a much more cohesive strategy uh, from an enterprise IT perspective. So in conclusion, I just wanted to highlight a few things that we're seeing a trend from a software defined approach, whether that's or in the cloud, you wanna be able to use hardware, whether it's x86 or x64 and your virtualization strategy. You wanna look at your traditional SAN and NAS implementations that require expensive and time consuming hardware and upgrades to allow for future scale and consolidated workloads. That's very important. 
these are the conversations we're having with our partners um, and our customers and, and, and the Microsoft teams as well. You want to be able to have immediate on-demand capacity through software that allows for rapid expansion. Being able to manage the workload, um, um, whether that's on-prem or in the cloud, and the ability to take distributed storage that can automatically provision as needed and transparently and not disruptively, but also integrating the industry standard platforms and protocols, not a proprietary hardware pro uh, um, a solution or a proprietary file system protocol. It's really important in today's um, in today's era to be able to look at this thing and say, hey, listen, I want to be able to scale this out and I want to make a long-term decision on how my infrastructure wants to, I, want, I want to look today as, as well as future considerations. But also, there's a massive financial benefit to this. The ability to use software to be able to reduce the and storage infrastructure and allow integration into any environment of choice, whether that's on-prem, Microsoft Azure, AWS, or, or private and public cloud providers. So I think it's really important, and I uh, and what gets me really excited is see the evolution of the industry from when we started in 2010 to now. That these predictions are now starting to come to fruition, and um, customers are starting to see real value in terms of um, developing an enterprise strategy to um, to be able to manage their infrastructure and um, and uh, provide a a better solution for their end user community. So with that said, um, we want to open it up for a Q&A in terms of um, any questions that the audience may have. As Yapin mentioned before, our next webinar is on the 25th. We're gonna get into much more detail and talk about considerations um, when it comes to traditional on-prem, hybrid cloud, as well as direct cloud access. And we're gonna talk about some specific use cases um, at the data center level, as well as at the branch office level. So um, we'd like to open up for any questions in the chat window. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Andy. And um, in the interim, while you're posing it, putting in your questions, uh, we'll actually pick them up one by one. And in the handout section of your, your GoToWebinar control panel, you can actually download some PDFs uh, that you can leverage. Um, you can also get to our website on www.talentstorage.com slash getting started. It contains a lot of rich information, videos, and everything that you can uh, can consult to uh, to learn more about what we're doing. Um, let me start off with um, with some of the questions. Uh, will we receive a recording afterwards? Yes, most definitely. If if everything works out well, we'll get a recording in your inbox tomorrow, and um, you will have it available for you to distribute that in your uh, in your network. And another question is coming in right now around um, why the perspective that VDI is not effective when working globally. You know, what we're seeing um, is predominantly that VDI has a specific use case for home users, remote users that are relatively close to where the applications and desktops are running and that need have a specific need in terms of resources when it comes to the applications that they're using. A good example is uh, one of our customers that is an architectural engineering uh, construction firm. They have 16,000 users, of which 1,000 users are pretty much mobile. And for the 1,000 users, they've impl implemented the VDI form. They will never be able to justify the cost associated with 16,000 users uh, running on a VDI form with uh, NVIDIA grid C GPUs, etc. And that's why we see that specific use case. If customers can leverage their own uh, and users can leverage their own desktops with powerful GPUs in them, it's cheaper to manage or to implement that infrastructure. Um, da -da 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 -da. Let me see what other questions we have. Uh, another question around the perfect world scenario is for Mac users. You know, I'm an avid Mac user myself. Um, I see a lot of my clients, they have, you know, up to 10, 20% of their users are Mac clients. And kind of what we're hearing as well is even though that Apple um, defined the SMB2 standard, uh, that may not be the, re the feasible solution for you. So the question here is, um, can we leverage AFP access clients as opposed to SMB2 access, uh, which is a big uh, PETA, that's what the Coleman states. And um, 
in a nutshell, yes. Well, if you're looking in the market for solutions that can kind of convert or um, act as a gateway for mounting AFP network locations to SMB, there are a lot of different options. We have customers that leverage either SMB as an integration point uh, with their clients with certain best practices, or they leverage AFP using uh, that third-party software that you can leverage in order to convert AFP to SMB. Um, so therefore, uh, I think that ramps up the questions. Other questions that are open here, I think we're coming up to the hour now. Uh, we will answer uh, through email. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to contact us at info at talentstorage.com. We will be uh, sharing the recording in the next day, as said. Uh, again, I would like to thank you very much and uh, looking forward to, uh, to meet up with you or welcome you to our session on October 25th, for which will you, you will receive an invite uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. So again, thank you very much. Have a great day.